Before we continue, I've been personally funding the Finding Genius podcast for four and a half years now, which has led to 2,700 plus interviews of clinicians, researchers, scientists, CEOs, and other amazing people who are working to advance science and improve our lives and our world. Even though this podcast gets 100,000 plus downloads a month, we need your help to reach hundreds of thousands more worldwide. Please visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click on Support Us. We have three levels of membership from 10 to $49 a month, including perks such as the ability to see ahead in our interview calendar and ask questions of upcoming guests, transcripts of podcasts you're interested in, the ability to request specific topics or guests, and more. Visit FindingGeniusPodcast.com and click Support Us today. Now, back to the show. Before we get started, I have a quick favor. I've been self-funding the Finding Genius podcast for five years now. I've done over 3,000 episodes. And as you can see on YouTube, we're up over a million views on the channel, which is fantastic. The next thing I really want to push on is to get up to 10,000 subscribers. Because once we do, we'll be able to put a donate button and uh, we'll be able to solicit donations to help keep the podcast running and to also get the Finding Genius Foundation moving along. We have a big project studying anxiety, depression, and PTSD and working on a product to help people overcome these problems because I've seen them explode recently after the, the last two years of the whole virus situation. So if you would, please subscribe to the podcast. That would help us tremendously give us a thumbs up and check in the description for buy me a coffee it's about five bucks if you could buy me a coffee i'd really appreciate it. it would help keep the channel going and i love coffee thank you forget frequently asked questions common sense common knowledge or google how about advice from a real genius 95 percent of people in any profession are good enough to be qualified and licensed five percent go above and beyond they become very good at what they do but only 0.1 percent a real Jesus. Richard Jacobs has made it his life's mission to find them for you. He hunts down and interviews geniuses in every field. Sleep science, cancer, stem cells, ketogenic diets, and more. Here come the geniuses. This is the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Finding Genius Podcast. I have uh, Dr. Sally Brown. She is a research associate professor, uh, part of the School of Forest Resources at University of Washington. We're going to talk about composting, organic residuals, and soil health. So, Sally, thank you for coming. Certainly. Yeah, tell me a bit about your background and then, uh, you know, about the work you're currently studying today and doing today. Uh, well, things have a way of coming full circle. So, um, I was born and raised in New York City uh, and grew up in Queens, and with a house and a garden that I never paid any attention to and worked as a chef in New York after college and decided that it was silly that you couldn't get locally grown produce. This was in the mid 80s. So a long time ago before a lot of terminology that's now common was like local boar and peri-urban agriculture and those terms weren't in existence. I started a whole set produce business bringing stuff from farms to restaurants and stores in New York. And from there, decided to go to graduate school to figure out how the resources that cities make could be used to enrich farmland. And basically, aside from buying the produce, the best things that the cities have for soil and farms is waste material, or what we've traditionally considered waste. So um, food scraps and stuff you flush. Okay, and uh, you're using that food waste to make what? Compost, or what do you do with yeah. it? Yeah, so food waste, there's a number of things that you can do with food waste. Um, compost is the easy and obvious thing. So anyway, to get to the second part of your original question, what I do now, I work a lot with how to best use these waste materials from cities, the benefits associated with using them as a soil amendment, and more and more now I work with how to build up agriculture in cities or community gardens, urban ag, how to get people to get their hands dirty. Well, if you can, uh, maybe we could focus on compost. Um, how much of an input is that for most of the, um, the, you know, the small farmers and gardeners that you see? And you know, how, how much compost can someone generate, let's say, from their own waste to offset their use of exogenous fertilizers? Uh, so you yourself, not enough. You make about 30 pounds of biosols, which is the stuff from wastewater treatment, and you probably generate 100 to 150 kilograms of food scraps, and that turns into maybe 30 kilograms wet compost. So 
it's really nice that not everybody gardens and that we have other kinds of ways to use. But the fact that you can turn this material into soil amendments and it works generally so well, the fact that it's not all being used to me is 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 a problem. What do you, what do you mean? So if someone's conscientious, makes their own compost, what percentage of their of the things they want to grow, let's say, could they theoretically do with just their own self-generated compost? So we we have a garden and we have a number of raised beds and they're probably say four by one meter, four by two meters, and we have you could grow enough potatoes for you for a year with the compost you make is one way to say it. So not nearly enough food, but some. Well, if I'm just a a vegetable gardener, can yeah. you express it in terms of like the percentage of a fertilizer I would need? If I'm growing, I don't know, a certain amount of vegetables, let's say, uh, I don't know. I don't know how to calculate this, but okay. is there so, a way to give another another type of estimate? Uh, yeah, there's a, this may be too nerdy for you, but so there have been studies out on how much nitrogen a person needs. There was just a study at how much nitrogen somebody living in Baltimore uses in a year. And for crops, non-meat, non-dairy, it's, I believe it's between six and 10 pounds of, and I'm sorry, I'm switching between standard and U.S. units, but six and 10 pounds, I believe, of nitrogen per person per year to grow everything but meat and dairy. And your food waste and your poop and pee all together make more than enough to do that if it's all collected. Your food so scraps- In terms of nitrogen, you can do it, but what about uh, phosphorus and uh, potassium? Phosphorus, you can do it as well. Phosphorus, you need about four pounds for non-meat, non-dairy. Potassium, I have no number off the top of my head. But for N and P, pretty close. But the portion of that that's in the food scraps is not very high. Most of it goes into wastewater. And there, a fair amount of the phosphorus is captured, but not very much of the nitrogen is captured. So we it, it's there for the taking. We just don't always take it and don't necessarily know how to take it. So oh, um, compost, what is it? Does it have just the right amount of the three macronutrients for a fertilizer? Or <clears throat> depending on how you do the compost, will it be deficient in one or another? Um, so not all compost is created equal. Um, it depends on what you put into the compost. Um, your feedstocks and the carbon to nitrogen ratio. So a whole lot of greens into the pile, meaning wetter, nutrient-rich material, as opposed to straw, woody material, cardboard. Then you get a more nutrient-rich compost. But if you don't do that and you actually put more browns in, then you can get a compost that really isn't all that rich and doesn't supply all that plants need. Okay, um... How much of your job is teaching versus um, just doing your own experimentation and research? So I do very little teaching in a college classroom. I teach mostly to people that work, professionals. So I guess it's more extension. Okay, but in your teaching, do you teach how to create compost or what are the main subjects that you teach? Uh, What do I teach? I teach basics of soil. I teach basics of fertilization, nitrogen and fertilizer on a global scale, on a local scale, and how to test soils for it. I teach about green stormwater infrastructure. I teach about growing things in urban areas and contaminants in urban soils. Yeah, let's talk about the, um, you know, growing in urban areas. What are some of the challenges that uh, gardeners will face you know, some of the unique pollutants or contaminants or pests, what do they need to overcome? So in an urban soil, one of your biggest concerns is some of the soil, if it's been in a lawn and been well tended or a garden that's been well tended, it's going to be a great soil and, and you'll have nothing but success growing in it. If it's a derelict lot and something that's been ignored, For a long period of time, very often one of your biggest obstacles is going to be all the garbage that's in the soil, Um, broken glass, um, broken bottles, plastic, pieces of metal. So it can, there's a real physical hazard to gardening or trying to garden in these soils. Another big deal is these ignored soils are typically not 
very conducive to growing things. Only a very vigorous and competitive weed is going to make it through. So what you need to do is improve the soil, both the fertility and the physical, the tilth of the soil, and that's where organic matter comes in. Another big concern with soils in urban areas is very often there they can have other contaminants that you can't see, but that can be a concern. The biggest one is lead, and that's from people driving cars in cities for decades. Lead is pretty ubiquitous in urban soils, and the biggest hazard associated with lead in a, in a soil is for a kid who wants to play in the dirt and ends up eating ice cream after they play and not washing their hands first. In other words, eating soil, direct ingestion of soil. Um, and when you add compost to a soil, one of the benefits of that is that uh, the lead that's in the soil gets diluted and so it's less hazard. It's also the soil starts growing things really well so that it's harder for a kid that wants to play in the dirt to get access to it. Digging through a lot of grass can make a kid want to lose interest and do something else. And finally, there's some work that suggests that depending on the compost, you can reduce how hazardous the lead in the soil is. So even if a kid did eat the dirt, there's a very good chance that no harm, you know, none of it would be absorbed. All right. Well, if I had a, uh, you know, an urban spot I wanted to plant in, what should I do? Should I first get the soil tested? Is that even reasonable? And so if I you, can't get it tested, can I do things to improve it? Or is it more, too dangerous to use if it's unknown? No, it's not too dangerous to use. And what's really hard with urban soils is depending on where you look, you'll get different guidance about what's safe and what's not safe. So for lead, for example, EPA says if it's children's, an area where a kid might play, 400 parts per million lead is your upper limit. You don't want to go higher than that. California said, no, we can do better than that. We, we're going to set our limit at 80 parts per million. Um, in Washington State, where I live, we decided to be midway in between and went for 250 parts per million. So that if you look online to see what's safe, you can really get confused and get discouraged. What none of those values tell you is how the lead can do harm and how total lead and the fraction of the total lead that can do harm is different. So if you were to get your soil tested, it would be really good to do a soil test at a lab that there are different extracts that can measure um, how much lead of the total is available. And a common soil extract in testing labs is called Malik 3. That's a really nice one to look at the available fraction of total lead. There's been work out of Ohio State to show the rain, the relationship between Malik 3 lead and the portion of total lead that can do harm. But the other thing you can do really easily is to build a raised bed if you want to grow food and get some compost to put in that bed or uh, a regulated product like a compost or a biosolids-based soil material and fill your bed and then you'll have really good yields and regulated material that regulated soil that'll be healthy and will do you justice and do your dinners justice. Can you remediate soil? What if you plant a particular weed no. or a plant that sucks up lead they disproportionately? Don't. They do it and then throw it away. And... No, no. That's a really yeah, nice but... idea. It's gotten some press with some things. There was the there was some thought that you could grow sunflowers and dump chelators into the soil that would then suck up the lead. That doesn't work for a number of reasons. Lead does not hyperaccumulate. That doesn't work. That's a, a lovely fairy tale that unfortunately is a fairy tale. So if a lot is compromised, there's nothing you could do except getting new soil. Uh, well, as soon as you start growing plants in the soil and as soon as you start tending to the soil, you're going to reduce the availability of the lead and any of the other metals, and you're going to also reduce their concentration. So you're making the soil safer every season. Yeah, but if you have a raised bed and you have two feet of, uh, you know, of soil, will the roots get down further than that and start to remediate the top part of the previous soil? Or how, how would that happen? Well, so... I'm not explaining well enough here. So if you have a contaminated soil and you till a bunch of compost into it, 
right away, say the soil has 300 lead, your compost will probably have 30 lead. So you till in the compost, all of a sudden your soil is probably in the top several centimeters down to 200 or 150. Then you're going to grow a crop. It's going to make it harder. The, the big hazard with lead is somebody eating dirt. It's not eating plants that were grown in it unless you don't wash them. And it's primarily a kid that's at risk because a kid is going to be much more efficient at absorbing lead once it's been eaten, much more. So your average two-year-old is going to be much more likely to eat dirt than your average 20-year-old and is going to absorb much more of the lead in soil once it's been ingested. Okay, so okay. you start growing and maybe you don't, or you, if you're going to bring a kid, you you put a big blanket down and you wash their hands before they eat. And over a couple of growing seasons, you've taken a vacant derelict lot and you've turned it into something that's a pleasure to look at and is a lot safer. Okay. So you till it in. Uh, is there a particular ratio that should be used, like a five to one uh, new soil and compost to old? Or what's the recommendation? So I use probably three inches of compost to the top six inches of soil as a starting point. Okay, right. And so just the top six inches, you till it in, what, one to one mix? Or what do you do? So the, well, the deal is, if you've ever tilled soil, it's not always an easy thing to do. And you don't always do it completely or very you or end up with a very heterogeneous or a very homogeneous mix. So you're going to get a heterogeneous mixture and your top three inches of compost is probably only going to get down two inches into the soil. And that's okay. You just plant. Okay. And as you do that, the soil composition gets better every year or what, what do you say? Yeah. The soil composition is going to get better every year. The soil is going to get healthier every year. And over time, you will build a very healthy, very um, fertile soil. Okay. How can you evaluate the, uh, the the daily or seasonal or yearly load of being in an urban area on your soil? How do you know when it's degraded to the point where it's not usable anymore? You got to bring in more outside soil. Um, I'm supposed to say you get your soil tested, but what I was getting at when I gave the different numbers from the different regulations was that there's not really a good consensus on what a safe number is. So I, I can't tell you three or seven. I can tell you it's going to depend. And again, if you're an adult and you're not bringing your your little kid to play in the soil and you wash your hands as you always do whenever you play, after you play in the soil and before you eat, it's okay. I mean, if you have your soil tested and you're worried, you garden in a raised bed. That's the best thing you can do. Okay. Um, any other uh, challenges for urban environment growing besides the space and the geometry? Is like, a, you know, is, is there a list of uh, certain plants that don't have a, a huge footprint that'll be, you know, have enough calories to help sustain you that are recommended? Is there like a, a list of, you know, best urban plants to grow? Well, if you, one of the big things where in Seattle and Tacoma in the Northwest is to plant on the parking strip between the sidewalk and the street. So big challenge there is browsers, people walking by, and um, people walking their dogs. So always wash before you, you eat. I don't mean right, to say okay. cavalier right. here, but um, no, anything. So you're in Chicago. It's probably warm enough for you to get tomatoes in the summer. You probably, if you want to grow greens, you want to do that earlier in the spring or later in the fall and not in July and August because it'll get too hot. You know, just normal what you grow. There's probably um, master gardeners or there may even be ag extension or other organizations there that can give you advice on what to grow and when to grow it. But it's, it's an interesting thing to learn, a really nice way to learn is to get a plot in a community garden and see what other gardeners are growing and talk to other gardeners. They'll know more and be able to give you advice. And it's a great way to learn. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Uh, what, what would you recommend for people to dip their toe in 
they live in an urban environment. They want to start growing stuff. Uh, will be the easiest thing for them to grow, you know, without you know. nice, easy thing and a trendy thing is kale. Kale is very, very forgiving. If you don't like kale, when it first comes to spring and you plant lettuces, they also are just they're lovely and it's it's they grow well and you you're amazed at how much you have. Another thing that's a wonderful thing to grow is flowers. And oh, that makes edible that flowers or just flowers? No, just flowers. They're just beautiful. So the community gardens in Seattle, a week or two ago, you could go and walk around and some people love their peonies. And just to go to these gardens and see these exotic varieties and different, all the different peonies in bloom, it's just beautiful. So if you're nervous about soil, another thing with doing something like growing flowers is that's a way to start tending the soil not put anybody in any risk and um just make something beautiful yeah it makes sense uh, what about microgreens or is that not typically done outside you know you gotta harvest them very at a certain stage they're tiny it's they're really easy to get a lot of soil on i would leave that to a fancy restaurant or a fancy grocery store and do something like uh, red leaf lettuce or arugula. Mm. Like we have arugula. So we're, we have our big garden about an hour and a half east of Seattle and we can't grow tomatoes in the soil. It's too cold. So we have greenhouses and I put spinach and arugula in the greenhouses a couple over a month ago. And right now we can get our first spinach and arugula of the season. It's ready now, so it's a nice thing. Okay, well, very good. Well, I know there's a lot more uh, we could talk about, but we're um, you know close out of time. W what's the best place for people to find out more about your particular work? And if people want to uh, do you know any sort of gardening, uh, again outside or especially in urban environments, what are some resources for them? So um, again, my work I I haven't been good about updating a website, but um, I write a column for journal called biocycle that's very down to earth and deals with all about organics and um recycling and soil safety and that's easy to find sally brown biocycle super easy i just have a two-part column on urban agriculture and environmental justice and soil contamination so that gets right to some of the stuff we were talking about today um master gardeners county extension agricultural extension are great sources of information for growing. Um, to learn how to make compost, um, there is the U.S. Compost Council is uh, a resource. Um, there is the Institute for Local Self-Reliance based in D.C. It's a nonprofit that supports a lot of community composting and how-to on composting. And again, BioCycle has tons on that as well. Oh, excellent resources. Okay. Well, Sally, thank you for coming on the podcast. It's been uh, really great. I appreciate you being here. Certainly, and have a good weekend. All right, hold on one second. If you like this podcast, please click the link in the description to subscribe and review us on iTunes. You've been listening to the Finding Genius Podcast with Richard Jacobs. If you like what you hear, be sure to review and subscribe to the Finding Genius Podcast on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. And want to be smarter than everybody else? Become a premium member at FindingGeniusPodcast.com. This podcast is for information only. No advice of any kind is being given. Any action you take or don't take as a result of listening is your sole responsibility. Consult professionals when advice is needed.